changeless be a living fire when ends life's transient dreams when death's cold solemn stream shall o'er me roll. Blessed Savior, then in love, fear and distrust remove. Oh, bear me safe above a Hi, and welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Ministries this week, whereas we are getting into Amos, and uh, we're getting into listen to what the Lord has to say. And it comes from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 15, which goes like this. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this week comes from Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had been sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? She said, The head of John the Baptist. She came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, 
and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his body and laid it in a tomb. Here ends our reading. Grace, mercy, and peace to us all from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I spoke about just a second ago, we are going to dig into Amos chapter 7, our Old Testament reading for today, and um, uh, we're going to dig into his history, who he is as a man, the impact that he made had on Christianity. But before we get into that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our enemies. Whether you have enemies or not, there are people out there that disagree with you people that don't like what you like, people that have different morals and values. And, well, whether you realize it or not, there are people out there that hate you, trying to shut you up. We live in a culture right now that is full of enemies, and if we go into Scripture, we are called to know our enemy. We are called to know who they are. We're taught this as we're growing up, whether it is in a sports uh, matchup where we uh, watch and identify their strengths and weaknesses by watching film or or trying to hear what other people are saying about them. We look at a chess master as they study the game of chess and their opponent's moves and strategies. We look at the business world and a company is going to study its competitors Look at the political realm, and you always know what you're going up against. Well, today we're talking about our enemies. And the ultimate enemy, the enemy that we go up against each and every day, the enemy that we go up against, this is the reason why we have enemies, is because of the ultimate enemy, and that is that of the old evil foe. So one of the reasons why we've offered a number of Bible studies here at Emmanuel over the last few years, talking about the old evil foe, the great deceiver, uh, the evil one, the devil himself. And as we walk out our doors each and every morning, we are reminded to make the sign of the cross both upon our forehead and upon our heart as we're going out to war each and every day. And as we walk out the doors every day, we are reminded that we have the true word of God with us. That we have the forgiveness of sins with us, whereas if we do, if we do screw up, yes, God comes and he forgives us our sins. That we have God's grace that comes with us each and every day, and through our baptism, yes, we have Jesus Christ himself who walks with us no matter where we go. But we are called to know our enemies. We are called to know his strategies, his tactics, his agenda, and how can we watch out and combat that which comes against us. So this morning, we ask the question, what are some of his strategies, his tactics, his agenda? What, what is he trying to do? And he's ultimately trying to get unbelievers kept in unbelief, right? He's trying to keep them where they are at. And he's also then trying to pull you as a believer away from him, away from your heavenly father. He wants to prevent you from hearing uh, the true word of God. He wants to prevent you from hearing from your maker, your redeemer, He wants you kept from leaving just this little video. He wants you to know that you are dead in your sins and left there for dead. But we have a God who comes back and and says, no, it doesn't stop there, but rather Jesus Christ has come and taken away all of your sins and that I walk with you day by day, each and every day whether you realize it or not. It's not about our feelings and how we feel, but rather God works with us. And again, through the waters of baptism, he has promises that he is with us no matter what. And that the devil is trying to get you to turn your faith into unbelief. 
to keep you so busy that you don't get into the Word of God, that you don't see what God is actually doing. We look here at Emmanuel and things that we can easily overlook are the uh, many students that showed up for VBS, 118 students in all. We had 86 volunteers. The body of Christ coming together celebrating that God does work through us. We just had a group go to Bayou Labatra, Alabama, a mission trip. Again, how easy it is for us to just dismiss it and be like, yeah, they're just going off. And we start asking, well, what is God doing? What is God doing? What is God doing? Well, hello. <laughs> Look at this. God is working through individuals here in this church right now at this very moment. God is at work. Sometimes we don't see it right away, but God is at work. And the Holy Spirit takes us and works in us and leads us as he is the one that comes and brings us our faith and our relationship with Jesus, our Messiah, and builds us into the Christians that we are today and will be. See, we lean on God's holy word, for it is God's word that, yes, shows us our sins, but then reveals to us that we have a God, a God who loves us and who has redeemed us. So how does the devil stop that? Maybe it is, again, keeping us so busy that we don't see what is actually going on, that we forget to pray, that we forget to go to the Word of God. And yeah, that happens. As there are so many voices in the world. We look at the Bible and the voices have always been around, whether it is from uh, uh, false prophets, counterfeit voices. It is said in history books that these prophets, these false prophets, actually outnumbered the true prophets because when these false prophets got up, they started preaching. Well, in order to earn money, they kept on telling them people what they wanted to hear. God's word has never been the popular option. So it's sad to say on this side of heaven, yes, there will be other voices. And the devil wants you to listen to other voices instead of listening to what the word of God has to say. Another common approach the devil uses is that he wants to come and silence the preachers. Just like we saw in our gospel reading, preachers, John the Baptist, his head is cut off, put on a silver platter. We look at scripture again, you see Isaiah who is sawn in half. Not a very good magic trick if you ask me. See Paul who is beheaded. See Peter, who is crucified upside down. Very often, prophets and apostles who were threatened, like Elijah, or they were imprisoned, like Jeremiah or Paul. But every time we see that even when the devil comes in and tries to shut up a prophet, stop the word of God from getting out into people's mouths, people's hearts, God takes them and uses that. That even when these prophets, prophets were killed. They had words, words for us that we get to read even here today, words that have withstood the test of time, words and many people to continue to hear this message. You see, the devil, the ruler of this fallen, corrupted world, strives to prevent sinners from hearing the true word of God, and that is exactly what's going on in our Old Testament reading of Amos. Amos, who's in the city of Bethel in 760 B.C. The little history for you. And when Solomon died, the northern ten tribes of Israel, they separated, and uh, we live in Texas here, they succeeded from the union, let's say. Okay? They, they, they left Israel, but that didn't change the way that God felt about them. God still saw them as his covenant people. And so God raised up prophets like Elijah and Elisha to go to them and preach to them. And now it was time for Amos to go to them and to teach them and to bring God's word into their midst. So Amos was there in, in Bethel where the masses had gathered to worship. Yes, they were to go down to the temple, but the northern kingdom, they wanted to do things their own way. And so they had a, a temple there in Bethel in the southern northern part. And then they had one in Dan in the northern part. He was in Bethel, southern part of the northern, northern part of Israel. 
Well, Amos was called, sent there by God to preach his word. So he went in there and he says, thus speaks Yahweh. The utterance of Yahweh, it says, listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. And he said that over and over because it wasn't his words, but rather they were the words from God that were given to him in order to proclaim to those people there. Sad to say, the authority, the false sanctuary in Bethel, they did not like it. They did not want to hear it. Amaziah, who is the priest there at Bethel, he complained about Amos to the king of Samaria. Amos was announcing God's words of judgment against a rebellious Israel, but Amaziah constructed a conspiracy saying, Amos has conspired against you. These are Amos' words, not God's. Amos kept on going up against or Amaziah kept going up against Amos as Amaziah just brought God, Amos and his words just down to mere politics, saying Amos is just trying to come up here to the northern part of Israel and bring us back down to where we don't want to be. Amos said, no, I'm just bringing the word of God to you. And Amaziah over and over and said, no, those are your words. You're out for your own profit and gain. See, the devil was at work as he tried to keep people from hearing the word of God. One way he does it is by leading people to think that Christianity and God's words are just mere politics. In turn, then people trivialize it, they discount it, they ignore it, they, they dismiss it just as human speech and human opinions. But no matter what, Amos kept saying, thus speaks the Lord. Thus speaks the Lord. Amaziah goes to him. He even says, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah. Eat bread there, prophesy there. Again, like he's just some prophet out for his own gain. But Amos just said, no, no. I've been sent here by God to reveal his words to you people. So Amaziah then revealed his real thinking, never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the temple of the kingdom. Which means that the false government of the northern tribes of, of Israel and Samaria there were joined together with the false temple. And they had an agenda. False government, false religion were joined together. Again, the devil was at work. The devil did not want people to hear the true word of God. They wanted to silence the prophets. They wanted to remove God's word. Makes us ask the question, well, what are we listening to? What false words are we getting into that we buy into and take us away from hearing the true word of God, whether it's something on our, our cell phones, whether it's something on the computer, or on the TV. What dangers are we facing? We are called to know our enemy, know the ultimate enemy, the devil, the old evil foe, as he wants to prevent you from hearing the life-giving word of God. The enemy wants sinners to only listen to themselves. The powers of the old age wanted Amos, the prophet of God, to leave in fact, they even said that his life was in danger because of it. Amaziah just wanted power. Amaziah had no intention to listening to God's word. But Amos kept preaching. He kept sharing what God had put on his heart. Even to the point of even announcing judgment upon Amaziah and his family and the whole nation of Israel. We find comfort in this because we know that God's word is going to get out. That God is the God who speaks, that he does not hide himself in secrecy or, or, or that you have, need to have some special access card to be able to get to what he's saying or we have to look inward. No, no. We find out that God will not be silenced no matter what the message might be, good or bad for people. 
See, the true God, the almighty creator, he speaks and we see throughout scripture already already in, in beginning in Genesis 1 that God comes. He speaks to us. He speaks in human language so that way we can all be heard and understood as he reveals his will and his ways for us, his children. It's not deceitful. But rather, he's very transparent. The true God, the maker of the heavens and the earth, he made himself the God of ancient Israel, made ancient Israel his own people, a treasured possession, always conveying the word to them. He used Amos from a working herdsman and a dresser of fig <laughs> sycamore figs. God was insistent that the word may be proclaimed. Why is God so insistent? on getting his word proclaimed? Because through the word, the Holy Spirit has a chance to give life, to bring new life, to bring restoration. And when people truly hear the word of God, they don't listen to the empty promises of this world, the false voices, the false words. And when the word is proclaimed, people turn away from their evil and turn to the Lord and God fulfills his promises in and through them. So we listen to what the Lord God has to say. If you want to know what happens to Amos, ancient Israel does reject his word. Words spoken by the true prophet, the true word of God. And they in turn brought God's judgment down upon themselves. In the 700s BC, God raised up the ancient Assyrians who came and destroyed the northern kingdom and most of the southern kingdom. Then a century later, God raised up the ancient Babylonians to destroy even Jerusalem. The death sentence came down on all of Israel just as Amos had announced. God does not deceive like other voices, but his word is true. But that's not the end of the story. God, through his prophet Amos, also spoke a promise. A promise that I will raise up the booth of David. Uh, God promised that he would raise up a Davidic king. That God would restore his people. That God would then incorporate all people, even the Gentiles, into his kingdom. So that all may come to know the true Lord, the maker, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that they too may inherit the promised land. This prophetic promise was fulfilled by God through Jesus, the Davidic king. That Jesus came as this new and greater prophet, a prophet that came after uh, Elijah and Elisha and Amos, a prophet to come and still did the same thing that these other prophets did. They in turn, and he in turn was treated Sadly, the same way. And even though Jesus embodied Israel, and even though Jesus embodied truth itself, people looked him straight in the face, saw truth, and still rejected and still denied him. He went to the cross. But on that cross, something so beautiful, so something so gorgeous. Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and then we have seen his glory. Glory as of the one and only come down from heaven. Comes who, who, he who comes and redeems all of us, all of mankind. God raised him up and highly exalted him above all. Jesus of Nazareth comes as Lord of all. The Holy Spirit now comes and continues to work through his word as he leaves the spirit behind as he goes up to heaven and says, the spirit will be left upon you. And so we listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. We listen. This is how we find life. This is how we keep the devil and the old evil foe away. That through the word of God, we come before God. We repent of our sinful nature so he may daily show us his promises and then create a sustaining and saving faith in us. We then lean on our baptism. 
as Jesus has placed his saving grace on us, knowing that, yes, we can wake up every morning knowing that we belong to him, not any evil forces. And we are able to partake of his supper as he unites us with himself and promises that one day we are his people and we will inherit the land that has no end, the new creation, and then be with Christ forever. So, listen to what the Lord God Almighty has to say. And all God's people said, amen. May God's blessings be with you this week. May God's blessings be upon you. May God's peace be with you. Thank you for joining us this week. We hope that you are able to come and visit, come and see us here on campus. We hope to see you soon. If you need anything, please give us a call. God's blessing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Oh